Assalamu alaikum everyone. Today we are taking you into a magical journey to one of the most captivating places on earth, Karnak Temple in Luxor, which is the largest open air museum in the world. Get ready to be transported to the ancient world of grandeur and mystique, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and let's embark on this journey together. The adventure begins with a 3 km cab ride from the hotel to Karnak Temple. Allah Akbar. The cab route leads us past Luxor Temple in the heart of Luxor. Even though we've passed by it several times in the last couple of days, the sight of these historic monuments never fails to leave us in awe. I would describe Egypt as a country with robust security measures. We notice either police or military personnel stationed around the roadside at nearly every attraction we visited. Beyond this stone wall is actually Sphinx Avenue which connects Luxor Temple and Karnak Temple and we'll take a closer look at them later on. Within just 10 minutes, we are now at Karnak Temple where we are welcomed by Eleanor Osmanolu, a friendly Egyptologist from Turkey who will guide us through the temple. Wearing the name Osmanolu, Eleanor is surprisingly a member of historical House of Osman, the Ottoman dynasty. What an intriguing revelation as we begin our journey. The entrance fee to Karnak Temple is 200 Egyptian pounds for foreign adults and for students you'll get a half price. And this is where we are somehow. We're going to walk all the way down through the Sphinx Avenue. These are the Sphinx Avenue. Look here. It looks like there was pieces of stones here. So this is a celebration way. Mm. Today we got like red carpet for the celebrity of Hollywood. You know, like what we do today. So that was a celebration way from 3,000 years ago. Mm. This temple actually more like a mosque for us nowadays. Okay. You know, which means a holy worshiping place. We don't live in the mosque, right? Yeah. So Earl for the Egyptian, 3,000 years ago, they never lived here, my friends. Mm. They just only came here. A salah, like prayers, mm. you know, like getting married. The marriage or the wedding ceremony is held here at the Egyptian temples mm. for the sick people. If they seek out cure, if they are feeling sick, mm. and they would like to be cured from their disease, what they do? They go there by the second lake. You see, that is the holy water. This is where they go. Everybody, royalties, I mean, from royal family, nobles, private people, rich and poor, they go there, you know, like Mecca for us, the water of Zamzam. So the same thing here, like similar little bit. Religious people, we call them priestess, like Sheikh for yeah. us. They go there and pray in the water. So they can make it very holy water. And they ask the sick people to drink the water, even to wash the body, so they can be cured from their diseases. And that's why you see here, my friends, the reason why we call it the holy lake or the holy water, because it's holy. But don't worry, it's, it's actually it's not natural. I mean, it's come from the Nile. Yeah. Today we're going to stop by this place, ladies. I'm going to show you where the source of the water, the canal, is used to bring the water from the Nile into the temple here. Mm -hmm. It goes down, but it's holy because the holy man, okay. the priests, they go and make it holy. Mm -hmm. Must be pray on the water. Yeah. We shall first speak about this crazy yeah. man. Yeah. I call him Casanova because you don't know how many wives and children he had. Okay, here it is. <laughs> 106 sons, 96 of daughters. Mm -hmm. 2,054 royal wives. Wow. It's like crazy. But anyway, he said that's a powerful, yeah. powerful man. Yes, he did for 67 years. The longest time ever. And he died old age, like 98 years old. Okay. Today, if you go to Egyptian museum, you can see him like he's a very happy man. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the most you are seeing here, ladies, this is the most modern and the last 
thing ever built. Mm. It's actually a mosque built by a specific royal family, you know, the Al-Fatimiyin, mm -hmm. the Fatimite. Mm -hmm. So they came from Tunisia. They ruled Egypt like five or six centuries. Mm -hmm. So this is roughly 500 years ago. It was more like a marina, like a dock, or actually like a harbor. Water came from the Nile. The Nile is not far away, 400 yeah. meters only behind the trees. Mm -hmm. So the water come over here. Okay, mm -hmm. and they use this for celebration. Mm -hmm. How they celebrate? They say Karnak it's like the house for the sun god Amun Ra. They worship the sun. Actually, they worship all creatures, birds, animals, insects like scarab beetle, mm -hmm. scarabew. But these are like all of them small or minor gods. Mm -hmm. So who was the most important? We call it king of the gods, the sun, mm -hmm. and they call it Amun Ra. Mm -hmm. What about the pharaohs, ladies? They worship the pharaoh. They worship the king. Mm -hmm. So the pharaoh is like a demigod. Which means they worship the god and the kings on earth. Okay. That's why now the king is acting according to this, mm -hmm. which means to celebrate, for example, the opet, I mean the anniversary. Mm -hmm. It's like the marriage. You know, like we do in the modern times, you know that the Egyptian world, they were the first uh -huh. nation ever. They celebrated the marriage between a married couple, like husband and wife. Uh -huh. They say that this actually got Amun Ra because he was very social people. Mm -hmm. They say the God is not alone, actually. They had the, fa the family, a father, mother, and son. So it's like a wife, husband, and, and their son. Mm -hmm. You say this is the house for the husband, the god. Mm. Where is the house of the wife, the lady, the mother? It's not so familiar. Mm. That's why they're linked together, my friends. Mm. Three kilometers. How? It seems heavy. Why is it linked then? They say we are married. Well, mm -hmm. this is the husband, they're the wife. This is why they are linked through the Sphinx Avenue. Which means that that is your senior ladies. Yes, maybe it begins or starts here, but guess where it's finished? By Luxor Temple First Gate, three kilometers, 1,000 statues. About on the stairs, you see that one ran yeah. there down. So this where you can imagine, 3,000 be those colors, of course. Mm -hmm. And fresh colors and painted everything. And they put both three, father, mother, and son. Mm -hmm. Inside the boat, they make three statues from gold. Oh. Mm. Family, of course. And they sail off that way to the Nile, from the Nile back to Luxor Temple to mm. whether sailing or walking. The same distance we can. Wow. After hearing many fascinating stories about the temple, we've arrived at its entrance. This imposing structure is the first pylon built by Nectanebo I who reigned in 380 to 362 BC, the same visionary responsible for the massive enclosure wall surrounding the temple. On the pylon walls, we could see people carving their names. These early temple visitors did this to mark their historic visit and show they were among the first to explore this sacred place. Next, our path leads us to the Great Court where the remnants of Kiosk of Tarhaka can be seen. Tarhaka was the fourth pharaoh of the 25th dynasty, the ruler of the Kingdom of Kush, the modern-day Sudan, and he was one of the black pharaohs. While this area was boasted a grandeur of 10 towering papyrus columns, each standing at an impressive 21 meters in height, today only a solitary column remains standing. From a border man is still allowed to come over here. Mm -hmm. But they say you must divide the temple in three places. You cannot bring the king to be next to someone from the commoner. That's why the first place is for the public. Oh. The next place there with pillars, you feel like it's private. Yeah, it's for nobles, rich people. Mm. And behind we have a small room for the king and the chef, actually the high priest, mm. right? So these are three, three places. Usually this place was built like this. From the beginning, from 3,000 years ago, it was like this. I mean, open, mm -hmm. uncovered, mm -hmm. for a spiritual and religious reason. Mm -hmm. They would be more happier because in this area, in this part of the temple, mm -hmm. where they used to be here, supposed to make offerings. Mm -hmm. The day of celebration, they come well dressed mm -hmm. and they bring actually with them big basket full of fresh flowers and fine fruits and actually drinks and juice and fruit and food and actually even oils and perfumes mm -hmm. and we're going to up on this altar offering ah, offering oh, oh, there's another one here but it's like so ah, okay. it's filled yes, okay. so they would be more heavier if this uncovered it was uncovered yes mm -hmm. so this god they are worshiping i mean the sun mm -hmm. you'd be more happier it's like look god what we got for you today do you see us that's why they make it uncover mm -hmm. so they can like yay the god saw the offerings i feel and already hear our our prayers mm -hmm. and accepted actually our offerings and prayers mm -hmm. for the acceptance reason that's why they make it uncovered mm -hmm. okay. i said a father a mother and son there's like a holy family they worshiped 3,000 years ago, but not anymore, of course. Mm -hmm. That's why how many chambers we got here, ladies? Three. three. Correct. Oh, the same in Luxo temple, so I saw three. Yes, correct, my dear, because also the father, the mother, and the son. Ah. Oh, Let's the, the wife. Okay. So, yes. And guess what? They were 3,000 years ago. Three statues from gold. Mm. But it's gone. Yes. Yeah, it's gone. Of course, I said gold. That's why no longer it's empty. We mm -hmm. melted in fire or either taken stone to the museum. Mm -hmm. 
eight years old, he was a baby king. Mm -hmm. Imagine, I mean a king, not a prince. Yeah. And also he died early, 19 or 18 years old. He died with malaria disease. Yeah. He wasn't killed. Right before reaching the second pylon, we encounter a colossal statue of Ramses II standing tall with his beloved wife Nefertari depicted at his feet. This is the meaning of her name, Nefertari. She's like, oh, here's the beautiful one, she's coming. Or the coming beauty. Different than Nefertari. She was wife of Akhenaten. I mean the beauty of the beauty. I mean the coming beauty. We are To show you my beauty, she's my favorite. Like when I say, look, I have 2,050 women, but no problem, she's still my favorite. Okay. The only one I allowed her to have her statue by my as we walk past the second pylon, which was built by Horemheb, who reigns in 1323 to 1295 BC, we enter the Great Hypostyle Hall, a magnificent structure constructed by Seti I during his reign from 1290 to 1279 BC, and it was completed by his son Ramses II. We do have roughly 100, 134 pillars, and they're all set in over as a high 25 meters, and they are colorful. Like here, look, at the top of the certificate, the colors can be seen, but at the lower birth, no, they are actually in very bad condition. Why? Erosion, time, and not to mention the worst problem is the flood. From what I see here, most of the pillars are being reconstructed. If you guys can see the smooth surface, that's a new one. And if you guys can see the rocks, that's the one that they found during the excavation period. These messy columns are neatly organized into 16 rows with 122 columns stands at a height of 10 meters while the remaining 12 soar to an impressive 21 meters with a diameter exceeding 3 meters. Gazing upward, we can behold the horizontal architrave gracefully resting on top of these columns which is estimated to weigh a staggering 70 tons. The pillars inside this hall are covered with multitude of hieroglyphic inscriptions. These inscriptions primarily depict scenes from ancient Egyptian mythology, historical events and religious rituals and it often praised the pharaoh who built and improved the temple, celebrating their authority and divine ties. For example, this is the cartouche of the throne name of Ramses II which read Usama'at Ra, Stepan Ra, which means the justice of Ra is powerful, chosen of Ra. It's really hot in the afternoon guys, so sorry for my outfit. Here in Karnak Temple, we can find two obelisks which is used back in the days to determine the time because as the sun is up, you can see the shadow down there. Anyway, these two obelisks belongs to a father and his daughter. The one on the right side was erected by Tutmos I who reigned in 1506 to 1493 BC. Tutmos I has a daughter named Hatshepsut who got married to her half-brother Tutmos II. She initially co-ruled Egypt with her stepson, the young Tutmos III. Eventually, in her seventh year of reign, she asserted her complete authority over the throne. The obelisk that you can see on the left is dedicated to Hatshepsut built in the year of 1457 BC and it is the second largest of all ancient Egyptian obelisks. It is made of one single piece of pink granite with a height of around 29 meters, weighing 343 tons. They are all for kings and men. Zip this room here for a woman. We had a powerful and strange woman. The first woman in all Egyptian history, like Cleopatra, she was the second. Mm -hmm. But this is the one, the first. Mm -hmm. She did rule as a man. Mm -hmm. She wore the fake beard. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. The devil crown. Mm -hmm. The physics like a man. The shirt killed like a queen. Mm -hmm. And guess where when she died, found her tomb and her mummy? At the okay. Queen's Valley? No, King's Valley. King's Valley. Oh, wow. We do have a place for ladies. Why? She made her last wish. Mm -hmm. I did rule like a king, like a man, and I shall be buried. Yeah. I did in like a king. So we found her mummy, a very old woman like that. It was all at King's Valley. She was feminist, actually. That big tower for the club. Mm -hmm. Okay, why do you call it Big Ben, do you think? Okay, you see, maybe it's named for the Saint Benjamin. But remember, this saint, he had an older brother. So it's supposed to be named after him. Mm -hmm. There's a story behind it. Mm -hmm. Because Ben, it's not an English definition of term. It's more, actually, Egyptian. Mm -hmm. They call it Opalus. Mm -hmm. so this is certainly how they, look, I mean, they call it back in that time. Because Opalus is Greek. Mm -hmm. Are they Greek? No. Egyptian. They spoke their mother tongue language with no hieroglyphic. They call it Ben. And Ben means look. 
So when they say big band, it's mean the big clock. And guess what? This is a clock. Because when they call it band, it's mean clock in Arabic. It's not a coincidence. Because band mean clock, and this is a clock, the sun dial. The sun clock here. How come? Look, there are damages. There's a shadow. Look, this actually, see here, the sun dial for sun clock. We use the shadows movement. How close you can know the time you use This is the restoration, not the original. They were before. The marks around, down on the floor. So this is a function, the first function. The second reason has another function, ladies. It's actually your Facebook. Because all the carvings, descriptions, yeah, these are your history. You're posting, they're live, they're autobiography. We're talking about what I did today, right? And besides, it's like a lighthouse. It was more like a GBS system. It's plain hell. The top there, it was covered. I mean, the pyramid only, not the rest of it. Only the top. It was covered with gold and silver. Wow. What happened when the sun rays was covered with gold and silver? Shiny, Shiny. Shiny. perfect. Which means it's actually a perfect idea to attract the people because they don't live here, but they don't know where and when. Yeah. Go and pray for the God. The Christians listen to the bells of the church. What about the Egyptian? The lighthouse, the gold in the top there. Now we got the second function, right? How many of opalists do you see ladies back in Bashan? I'm talking about Karak, not Luxor. Because in Luxor, temple we used to have opalists. There are two actually. But there were nine here. Nine? Wow. Then we got three. Six are missing. So where are? One of my home in Istanbul, Turkey. No. Is, yeah, Istanbul Square, Sultan Ahmed Square. The second one, two in Vatican. Oh. Actually in Italy, one in Rome. Central Park in America, US. Another one in Washington, the last one Thames River, UK. They're all uplist from here, right? Now, ladies, what about Washington DC? It's Treblinka. What about the fronts? Look, the Plaza Concord or Concord Square was taken ladies from Luxor too. Oh. Not from Carnac too. Close by, there's a small area leading to a sanctuary where priests toy a portable shrine for carrying the god's statues in processions. Inside this area, built by Tutmos III, you'll find two granite columns. One is adorned with a raised relief of a papyrus symbolizing Upper Egypt and the other features an Egyptian lily symbolizing Lower Egypt. Inside, once a year, 21st of December, so it's still best buy. On the top of this stone there, this table, so that's where the statue was. Once a year, why? So this is a birthday of Amundra. And guess what? They say that actually the Christmas itself is gone from Egypt. Now, it's see more things. I was talking to you back. Look here, ladies. Ta da! That's him. He feels like he's like smiling. He's being sarcastic, actually. So, you uh, know, uh, uh, the scholar said that he's, he, he did it in purpose. He said, ha, look at you. I am the pharaoh who never lost one war, one battlefield in my life. Because now he's looking at what? The prisoners, the slaves, look. They got defeated in the war, and they were brought to Egypt like slaves, tied their hands on their back. Where were they? Look, chains and ropes, and tied the hands like your hands back. Who are they? That's why he's laughing. And they come from different places of the world. Look, this guy come from where? Guess where? Elu, today is Elat, Israel. Israel. He's a Jewish. This guy, you see the lion is Elsu, two lion, Khalili, or Al Khalil city in Palestine. Oh, Up there, yes. They're here from Lebo, wherever. They come from all over the world and they're all were slaves. Khalili. Got defeated, yeah. Khalili. Oh, Khalili. you are here? And I'm just gonna point out for you. Okay. okay. This is the calendar, the numbers. Mm -hmm. right? This is number one. Yeah. So which means it's two. And this is three. Look, three. This is four. One, two, three, four. This side. Down it's ten. Ten. So eleven. Twelve. 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 There are two sides more. Twelve. And this is twenty-one. And this is 30, the last one 30. Mm -hmm. And this is 26. Mm. 26. And there is a sign here looks like upside down, upside down 9. Mm. It's 100. Oh. 128. 28. So the last number 450. 450. It looks like Roman, but actually it's the Egyptian who made this first. Mm. Oh. The Romans inspired by them. Actually, Egyptian, not all the numbers, from one to million, but not zero. Funny, yes, I know. <laughs> zero made for by the Arabs. Mm. They know also the calendar, four seasons of the year, 12 months, wow. 360 days of the year. Mm. Funny to tell the Egyptians, they were making like more like, you know, the National Geographic, mm -hmm. the channel discovery for the animals. Mm -hmm. They are making a documentary. Mm -hmm. You notice how the lioness, I mean the female, is more wild, stronger, aggressive than lion. 
They say, look, she protect the cubs, the new babies. She's go for hunting. She protects it here. So that's why she's, the lioness is more actually powerful than lion. That's why, guess what? They worship lioness. They didn't worship the lion. I know they say she's a goddess of war, protection. That's why you can see there's a lioness. Right and left, look. Because she's facing right and left, guarding the, the front lines of Egypt. South and north. This is the largest temple ever exists in the world and it has been built back in at least 3,000 years ago. On our way to the sacred lake, we found the top section of the third obelisk at Karna, originally constructed in 1457 BC and it was dedicated to Hatshepsut. Unfortunately, it fell down during an earthquake. However, in a remarkable effort just two months after our visit, this obelisk had been painstakingly restored and once again stands tall. In the vicinity, we can find the largest pharaonic sacred scarab ever unearthed to date. It was a heartfelt gift from Amenhotep III to his wife intended to ensure enduring love, promote her health and well-being. In ancient times, people would even circle around the scarab up to seven times seeking good fortune. It was mixed not only with Baganis, stones and sons. At that time, of the first, they were also prophets, like Yusuf or Joseph, peace be upon him, So that's why they got this influence, first from here. That's why it could be possibly. Mecca just came later as an influence come from Egypt. This is a very old land. That's why everything's come from here, even religion. So that's why, no surprise why they do this. Ladies, they are just making some dreams and wishes. You don't believe seven times, like, you know, good luck. So your wish comes through like within seven months. And you see here, so down, it's the holy land. This is the lake that our guide talked about earlier and this is where the sound and light show is done every night. This lake was dug by Tutmos III around 3,500 years ago with dimensions measuring 120 meters by 77 meters. It was meticulously lined with stone walls and featured stairways leading down to its pristine waters. Beyond its role in temple rituals, the sacred lake also served as a residence for holy ghosts of Amun representing Amun-Ra's symbolism. Remarkably, until this day, the lake remained unfaltering, neither drying up nor experienced fluctuations in water level even during the annual Nile flood. I have a bad news guys, I just broke my phone. I just only use it for one week and the screen is broken. I went for a break. Just now I sit on that rocks because my feet is hurting because I'm wearing double socks and I take out one of them. And I didn't realize that because I put my bag on the ground and my phone with the tripod here on top of the bag and later I took the bag to store my socks and I completely forgot about the phone and then later I found the phone on the ground and the screen is broken so I can no longer take beautiful photo with that because most of the place like museum and so on you can't bring your camera but I have this small camera here it's okay I'll try to make the best use of it anyway our visit to Karnak temple had to be shortened because my mom and sister need to catch their flight to Cairo Witnessing the immense scale of construction and intricate details of this temple reminds us of the ancient civilization and their faith highlighting the importance of preserving history and knowledge as it allows us to reflect on the past and learn from it. The Karnak Temple Complex is a testament to the power and wealth of the pharaoh who built it. It took centuries to build and it required the labor of thousands of people. The pharaohs who built this temple are long gone and their legacy is nothing but ruins. This is a reminder of the fleeting nature of power and wealth. All human beings, no matter how powerful and wealthy they may be, are ultimately mortal. Their empires and possessions will eventually crumble to dust. This is the truth that is often difficult to accept but it is an important lesson to learn. As Muslim, we believe that this world is a test and a temporary abode while the permanent one is in the afterlife. Therefore, we must prepare ourselves for the afterlife by doing good deeds, even the bad deeds and striving to achieve paradise. Visiting places like Karnak Temple shows that what's mentioned in Al-Quran is the truth even though Allah didn't specify which pharaoh it was. The pharaoh mentioned in Al-Quran loved to build huge and tall buildings, 
He was a tyrant and an arrogant king, declaring himself as a god. He even asked his chief to build him a lofty tower so he could look at the god of Prophet Musa or Moses to prove that Prophet Musa is lying. The footage that I show you guys perhaps only cover 20% of Karnak Temple's vast area. I highly recommend visiting in person to fully experience the grand door of ancient Egypt and make sure to hire a guide for a richer understanding of its history and significance. I must bid you farewell for now as we prepare for a 14 hour train ride to Cairo tonight. If you have enjoyed this video, make sure to give me a thumbs up and stay tuned for more travel inspirations. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already. Until next time, take care and may your journeys be filled with blessings. Maasalama. Thank you.